Well, it's really great to be here. Thank you all for coming, and uh, I'm really excited. First off, give a round of applause to all the people that organized this event. This takes a lot of work. Oh. So uh, first off, I have a question for you all. How many of you would uh, like to change the world? Show of hands. OK, good. I think that that's why we are all here. That brings us together, that in some way, we all want to change the world. So to set the stage, that's why I'm here, to tell you how. And I, like all of you, or most of you, there are some non-students in the room, was a student here at UCSD. I graduated in 2015. Here's a younger version of me. Um, you probably can't recognize me, I'm sure. But I started out in electrical engineering. I wanted to work on solar panels, things like cold fusion. I was going to revolutionize the uh, energy system of the world. But then the realities of homework and computer coding set in, and I decided to change majors. So environmental systems was a better fit for me. Uh, but while I changed, I thought, I need to do something to boost my resume. So I had the next great idea. Uh, another show of hands, how many of you have had a, the next multi-million dollar idea that's going to be the next big business? No? No business ideas out there? OK, well, anyway, I thought this is going to revolutionize transportation on campus. I got students together. We met for years with the staff and faculty. We even got $100,000 worth of student funding to get this pilot program going. My next big idea was? Dockless bike sharing. And I'll have to say that we didn't end up getting the pilot program going, but it sure is popular now. And even though we were met with failure at the beginning, you can see that that small attempt led to something because we still uh, we have the dockless bike sharing on campus today, and it's all around San Diego. So what I learned from this is to be an opportunist. Don't get discouraged. See the big picture. And a good idea isn't good enough. You have to have timing and targeting. So what I did was I found uh, a really great group of students, and we ended up making a lot of change on this campus. Uh, you have to figure out where we are, what we need to uh, gain to go from where we are now to where we need to be. So you gain the skills, the expertise to fill the gap to get there. You can go from before, where we had tons of opportunity for change on this campus. And we found the low-hanging fruit. We were being opportunists. We built bike paths, bike repair stations, all over. And it transformed the face of UCSD. Anything from the transportation program to new community gardens. So I ended up graduating, taking all that learned expertise. I'd had some failures, some successes. I ended up at City Hall, and any Parks and Recreation fans out there in the audience, TV show, yeah? I ended up like in a Leslie Nope style situation, but a uh, little bit different. So I worked at City Hall, worked in sustainability a little bit, but wasn't quite there, and so I ended up saving enough money to travel the world for uh, about 11 and a half months. I worked really hard, I did multiple jobs, and ended up in France last year, and another opportunity came up because I missed a ferry, but I ended up finding an opportunity in Curacao through mutual friends. So a little bit about Curacao. They have uh, 13 political parties, 29 candidates up in each, with about 250 candidates running for parliamentary elections. And I was going to help a candidate get elected to parliament. But there were only 21 available seats. So after a Molotov cocktail was thrown through our window, and we ended up picking trash up on the side of the road, we did a lot of hard campaigning. Because Curacao is beautiful, but there are no federal protections for mangroves, coral reefs. And despite the odds, my candidate, Gisette, won. There she is on election night. There she is on the right there uh, in parliament. And a few months later, I got news that she passed a law to federally protect the mangroves in Curacao. So again, take the opportunities as they come along. And if anyone's interested in starting a Caribbean island consulting company, let me know. This is my future boat. Talk to me after the speech. So sustainability in everything. You have to be strategic as well as an opportunist. The Chevrons of the world, I'm sure that they have sustainability departments that we all can be a part of in whatever shape or form. 
But what do we focus on? Yoga pants and veggie options probably aren't going to be enough to save the world. You have to think small, but you also have to think big because this is the reality of our world. Millions of people living off of animal dung for fuel, our massive recyc electronic recycling problems, waste disposal issues, and plastic floating in the ocean. So you have to think big as well as small. So in being strategic, you have to think in the long, long term. Progress is slow yet incremental, but once you win those victories, for example, the mangroves being protected in Curacao or dockless bike sharing spreading off campus, it's harder to undo that progress. It's harder to go backwards. So the next big thing is be a networker because our strengths are in our people. That's what I learned after traveling to over 30 countries and working in many industries, that our true strengths lie within ourselves. The people that we meet and the networks that we build, because there's great people in every country all over the world doing fantastic, amazing work towards making the world a better place. So be a networker. Our greatest strength is our love and our hope for a better future. Whether it's cleaning up after a hurricane in Barbuda, this is our future leaders right here. I met these people while traveling to Barbuda to help with repairing the island nation of Barbuda. It's the youth, the young leaders of tomorrow that we have to invest in, but not only invest in, we have to connect. The work that we're doing is fantastic. And in closing, remember, the three things are to be strategic, to be an opportunist, and to be a networker. Because above all, love is our most sustainable resource. Thank you. Everybody, my name is Belinda Ramirez, and like, like you said, I'm currently a fourth year anthropology PhD student. We have an eight year long program, so I'm only halfway there. Uh, wish me luck. Um, uh, in anthropology, we tend to read papers instead of giving these kind of cool TED style, TED style type talks, so uh, I'm a little nervous and out of my comfort zone. Uh, wish me luck again for that, too. So my research uh, has developed, as was mentioned earlier. It's taken a form from uh, agrarian politics in the Ecuadorian Amazon, and it's important to me now to focus my dissertation work on San Diego, somewhere local to me. I'm uh, from Los Angeles, and I now have been living here for quite a while in San Diego. So I'm looking at the urban agriculture movement here. And I want to start with a story. When I was about 10 years old, I, uh, my family and I took a trip up to Eugene, Oregon, where a lot of my mom's side of the family lives. And there, I was helping my Aunt Nancy pull, uh, harvest some, some uh, crops from her, her home garden. If any of you have been to Eugene, you know that uh, home gardening is just normalized there. Everyone's got a front yard home garden. It's just what you do. As I was pulling out, carrots, I found one that was forked, kind of like the one you see. And, uh, it surprised me. It blew my mind. I had no idea that this was even a possibility. Carrots are supposed to be a certain shape, a certain color, and that's that. Growing up in the suburbs of Los Angeles, this was normal to me. And of course, this surprise isn't abnormal. This is something that a lot of us who have grown up in urban centers experience. Um, have you ever seen how What about an artichoke if it hasn't been plucked when it's ready to eat? And pineapples, how the heck do those things grow? These are all things that we've eaten growing up, just going to the grocery store, we pick these up, but we don't have the knowledge about where it comes, how it's cultivated. And uh, through the course of this talk, I'm gonna talk a little bit about why that is. And it's about the separation between us and what we eat, where we live and where our food is produced. So, like I said, I'm an anthropologist, but not this kind. I uh, study groups, communities, and how they're put together. I'm interested in living human beings, why we're so interesting, why we get together, and sorry about the in and out, why we, uh, why we do what we do. I think it's fascinating. It's good to, thank you.
Okay. In anthropology, we tend to try to make, uh, make interesting the things that are mundane. So that's what I'm doing with urban agriculture. And these are out of order. So in urban agriculture, we need to tell a story about industrialization. Industrialization started in uh, late 1700s to about the mid 1800s. In this time, there was new technologies, new technologies that uh, made it possible for us to produce faster and quicker than we ever were able, able to before. But in order to produce, we needed a couple things. We needed resources, we needed people to consume those resources, and we needed uh, some sort of way for wealth to be uh, distributed or, or, or used, the wealth that was produced uh, from industrialization. And cities were what allowed us to do that. In cities, however, there were lots of people. And how do, we, how do we make sure that all of those people are able to eat? How do, we, how do they survive, essentially? So after a while, World War II comes around, and the United States becomes a world powerhouse. At this time, uh, new technologies for agriculture are developed that make it possible for, for people to eat as much as they want to, essentially. Uh, this is, a, for instance, a, a new way of doing uh, irrigation for large-scale commercial production. Not quite as large-scale as we have today, but it was getting there. Uh, another example is uh, threshers that made it possible for grain to be separated from the rest of plants. Um, that made it obviously much less time-consuming and uh, labor-intensive for farmers. However, in this process, uh, we, there was this attempt to make food available for everybody. And that was, that was true. That, that came to pass to some, for, for some people anyway. But it wasn't like that for the rest of the world. So in about the 1930s to about the 1960s, there was this, this thing called the Green Revolution that maybe some of you know about. The Green Revolution made it possible for, um, for many people across the world to eat. However, it relied on high yield crops, which we see nowadays as, is what all of our food is based on, rice, corn, and wheat. It also created a sort of dependency relationship between the global north and the global south. In this process, the global south were given resources from the global north, uh, resources such as pesticides, fertilizers, uh, technologies uh, uh, like, like the ones you see here, but you know, a little more updated perhaps. And this made it to where the global south was now giving the global north the food it needed to survive, the huge populations growing in cities that I mentioned. And again, this dependency relationship was created. So now food is being sent from the global south, south to the global north. The people in the global north are eating these high yield crops. The global north is then distributing, repackaging these foods back and giving it back to the global south. That's the dependency relationship. And of course, this, of course, this uh, benefits only a handful of folks who become very wealthy off of this, uh, this structure. This is a picture of um, uh, olive wood gardens in Na National City here in San Diego. Um, so, Green Revolution happens, relationships. There are new, nowadays, ways of thinking about how to get our food, and that's what I look into. I look into urban agriculture as a way of, for people to take matters into their own hands and grow their own food and uh, work outside of this corporate uh, industrialized food system. There are certain examples of this happening elsewhere in the United States, such as Los Angeles. Uh, maybe you've heard of uh, the gorilla gardener, Ron Finley. He uh, has taken and co-opted uh, urban spaces, like margins and things, uh, that, that little space between the sidewalk and the street that no one ever uses, taking those spaces and making sure that they're used to, uh, to increase equitable food uh, knowledge and production, bringing food to folks who don't have great access to that in food deserts. Uh, Detroit is another great example of urban agriculture with uh, the retreat of industrial systems. Uh, folks in Detroit 
some folks anyway, have taken to re, uh, repurposing urban landscapes to make urban agriculture uh, um, vi a viable sort of food uh, source for folks there. So why San Diego? Why is San Diego important in this case as well? So California, as we all know, is a huge agricultural powerhouse in the United States. Uh, we produce about a third of the, of the whole nation's um, uh, vegetables and then two-thirds of our fruits and nuts as well. And we produce about $44.7 billion in agricultural productions per year with exports to hundreds of countries around the world. San Diego follows that trend and uh, we are known for avocados, maybe some of you know this. We produce quite a lot of avocados here, as well as ornamental trees and shrubs. So agriculturalists in San Diego are, are very proud of the fact that we are the number one nation pr uh, for small farms, which means less than 10 acres in, <coughs> in the United States. However, like other places, other urban areas in the United States, there are um, there's a long history of racial segregation um, based on geographic area and neighborhoods. This is a, a, an older map of redlining in San Diego. Redlining is the, the intentional and systematic um, separating of communities and denial of services such as bank loans um, to, to certain communities uh, based on race, ethnicity, and other discriminatory factors. And of course, the, that, that denial of services only further reinforces the kind of poverty that is experienced within certain communities, of course. So my work, in my work, I look at urban agriculture as it exists within those areas that receive fewer resources uh, from the government, from other folks, um, of those services, for instance, that are denied via redlining. And these are five here that I'll, I'll be highlighting in my field work. I start this next, this next year. Uh, but for now, I'll just talk about two. The Ocean View Growing Grounds and Mount Hope Community Garden that you see up, up the top. They're in southeast, southeastern San Diego. So Mount Hope Community Garden is, uh, was, was first put on or started in 2010 by uh, the Project New Village. It's a nonprofit in southeastern San Diego. And uh, in this area, they've also started a farmer's market to bring access to, to fresh foods and, and fruits and vegetables to community members who live in southeastern San Diego, which has been determined to be a, a, a food desert with high levels of obesity and chronic illnesses due to a lack of access to, to healthy foods, as along with other social and economic factors. Ocean View Growing Grounds is uh, kind of seven minutes away from Mount Hope Community Garden, also servicing folks in the area in the Mountain View neighborhood. In this area, uh, the UCSD Bioregional Center um, uh, with Keith, Keith Bazzoli, as well as uh, folks from the uh, Global Action Resource Center, it's a nonprofit, have worked with community members to build this, uh, this community garden back in 2012. And it is uh, currently servicing the people there. I'm going to skip through. <laughs> so this is uh, Susie's farm, unfortunately, went out of business this last summer. <clears throat> so in all of this work, it is really important to talk about food justice. Uh, food justice being the idea that <clears throat> that food should not only be grown, by, grown in a local setting, but it should be distributed and accessed equally among all people in a community. But that's just, it's not enough. I want to focus, too, on food sovereignty. Food sovereignty as an important aspect of moving forward, moving away from the corporate industrialized food system that I set up a little bit at the beginning. In food sovereignty, it's not enough to just have uh, greater access to your own uh, food and agriculture, you have to have those decisions be made by the people in the communities themselves. So nonprofits, etc., do a lot of good work in starting these, these conversations, but the ultimate decisions have to come from people in the neighborhoods where you're doing work, um, people who want to uh, increase their life quality and have a better experience. So I want to urge us all to look into the farm bill right now. It's a uh, 
it's in the House of Representatives uh, being negotiated. Go to 2018farmbill.org, I believe it is. And uh, these, these conversations are happening now for systems that affect all of us. Um, see the ways in which they can influence San Diego agriculture and urban agriculture, if it does at all. Call out your, your representatives and say how it's important to you. And I want us all to, to kind of come away from this knowing or considering the conversation about food sovereignty and the ways that we can make things equitable for everybody, food access and make it healthy, make a healthier future and think of alternatives to what we currently have. Thank you. All right, thank you so much for having me. It's really a pleasure being here and a huge shout out to the people who organized this event. It's amazing. Congratulations, really awesome job. So I'm gonna start with a confession. I have a confession to make. I didn't come to sustainability in the usual way. I didn't get involved to save the planet, although of course I'm devastated by its destruction. I didn't get involved to save humanity, although I certainly don't wish for the demise of the human race. Now I got involved for a very selfish reason. I couldn't take it anymore. I was so tired of living in one of the wealthiest countries on the planet and having to worry about whether the water I drank was safe or whether the food I ate was going to make me sick or if the clothes I wore were containing toxic chemicals. I was so tired of hearing about the horrifying island of plastic floating in our oceans and the, the extinction of species that I didn't even know had existed. And I wasn't interested in solutions that were going to be great 10 years from now. No, because I'm not interested in making tomorrow better. I'm interested in today. I want to make today better. The thing is, though, all these problems, they seem so overwhelming, right? You think about them, and it feels almost insurmountable, especially when addressed by one person. A lot of us hear about things like the destruction of the rainforest, and we just want to kind of turn away. Or we watch a program about sea level rise, and we want to change the channel because it's so overwhelming and it feels like, what, what could we possibly do? What impact could we as an individual have, or I as an individual have? Well, I'm here to tell you that it's actually a whole lot. Our nonprofit, My Green Lab, was founded on the idea that individual changes, when aggregated together, can have a profound impact. And I intend to show you today that that is true. Over the next 10 minutes, we're going to look at one aspect of individual behavior and one thing that we can change. And that is something that affects us all every day, what we buy. There are many factors that we take into consideration when personal responsibility, environmental responsibility, maybe even brand, to name a few. And although we don't often think about it, these are actually our values around purchasing. For example, my parents, who I love dearly, will drive 30 minutes in one direction to buy gas that is 10 cents a gallon cheaper than the local gas stations. Because clearly, they value price over convenience. And when you purchase something, you're signaling to a company what your priorities and values are, whether or not you're conscious of it, and whether that's where your intentions actually lie. To give you an example, a few weeks ago, I was at a conference that was held at a hotel. And I don't know if it was the hotel's decision or maybe it was a conference organizer's decision, but next to the coffee and tea, the only option were paper cups with plastic lids. So of course, everybody, when they went to get coffee or tea, took a paper cup with a plastic lid. Oftentimes, many of them throughout the day. So of course, I inquired of the hotel staff, well, why don't you have mugs? Is there a particular reason why we're using paper and plastic and not mugs? And they said to me, well, everybody's fine with the plastic and the paper. Because what they saw was people were using them. They weren't interested in whether people really love paper cups and would always use a paper cup with a plastic lid regardless of the options, or whether people were just too tired to care and just took whatever was there, or whether people actually would have preferred a mug but just didn't think to ask. Because all they saw were the, the results of people's actions, not anybody's intentions. So the question I have is, well, what would it have taken for them to switch from those paper cups to the mugs? 
it's clearly my asking every day for a mug, which they gave me, was not sufficient for them to switch from paper to ceramic. But we all know that there is some tipping point, right? That it's, that it's not 100% and it's not one person, but that there is some line at which enough people start to do something and all of a sudden there's a sort of a tidal wave and a swell and things start to change. So to investigate that line, I'm gonna draw from two examples from our industry, which is the laboratory sustainability industry. And the first example involves something called an ultra low temperature freezer. This is a very highly specialized type of freezer that's designed to store samples, scientific samples, at low temperatures, minus 70, minus 80 degrees Celsius. And when I worked in the lab, so I used to be a neuroscientist before founding my green lab, these freezers were purchased almost exclusively on the basis of price. I mean, assuming the performance was okay. So if we're, we're assuming that performance is, is good in all of the freezers, it really just came down to price. And manufacturers, they understood this. They got that message loud and clear from the scientists. So they would manufacture their freezers as inexpensively as possible in order to maintain performance. And what happened? Well, while you had the commercial kitchen freezer industry and the residential freezer industry switching over to natural refrigerants and looking at energy efficiency, participating in the Energy Star program, you had the life science freezer market basically stagnant for 30 years, using high global warming potential refrigerants, not really thinking about energy efficiency. As scientists, all we had were paper cups. And then, a company got an idea, and they said, they looked at some of these other industries, and they said, you know what? Other people seem to care about environmental responsibility. Other people seem to care about energy efficiency. What if we create a freezer that has these values in mind? Perhaps scientists might be interested in that. So this freezer came on the market. It was incredibly energy efficient. It used all natural refrigerants. And finally, we had a mug, which was great. The thing is, though, habits can be hard to change. So scientists are, were used to buying the same thing over and over again. So their freezer would break, or they needed a new freezer, and they simply went to the same vendor and said, you know what, I need another one of those. Please give me the best price possible, right? So just like at the hotel, the mugs were available, but people didn't think to ask about them, didn't really think about that. They just continued with their habits, right? Very, un very unconscious of what they were doing. So what we did as part of our nonprofit and as, as with a lot of other people in the states, about a group of about 20 of us decided, you know what, we're going to spread the word about this. We're going to let people know that there are energy efficient freezers on the market. And together, we slowly started to get freezer, these freezers to be adopted. And at some point, about three years ago, we finally reached that tipping point. And the most amazing thing happened. Some of the largest manufacturers in the world of these products decided, oh my gosh, we could make energy efficient freezers as well. We see that scientists want to purchase them. So now they start making energy efficient models, which means the EPA and Energy Star start take, kind of getting wind of this and saying, well, we should create a product category for this. So they create a product category for it. And the California utility companies go, well, we want to be on board with this. We want to incentivize people to buy energy efficient freezers. So now they have incentives for energy efficient freezers. And all of a sudden, we have six different models. And scientists are actually aware of energy efficient freezers. And it's amazing. And do you want to know what fraction of the market we needed to buy into the idea of energy efficient freezers in order for all of that to happen? 4%. 4% of scientists had to say, we care about sustainability in order for a $600 million a year industry to start to change. That's the work of 5,000 scientists buying freezers and about 60 people in the states working together. That's amazing. It is shocking what we're able to do when we work together. We have so much more power than we realize. I'm going to give you one other example. If we kind of zoom out a bit on our industry, so I kind of spent some time looking at a piece of equipment. Now we're going to look at the laboratory sustainability industry as a whole, which is something I'm sure many of you have given a lot of thought to, right? <laughs> so if we look at the idea of trying to understand, trying to address sustainability in laboratories, to so reduce the environmental impact of laboratories. If we look back five years, what you'll see is that there are about 10 campuses in the country that had a program dedicated to laboratory sustainability, less than 1%. 
So through the work of our nonprofit, and again, a, a group of individuals who are very dedicated to this cause, now, five years later, there are 60 campuses in the, in the US that have a dedicated person looking at what we call green labs and about another 40 that have some staff member who has some of their time devoted to environmental sustainability in laboratories. So about 100 campuses in total. That's 100 campuses of a, out of about 2,200 across the states. And even at that level, we are starting to see multi-million dollar companies, multi-billion dollar companies, change how they message to scientists. All of a sudden, if you go to the home pages of some of these companies, sustainability is on the front page. They're redesigning their products to be more sustainable. They're looking at bio-based materials. They're going back to their R&D departments and, and actually rethinking how their products are made. They're looking at their packaging materials and thinking, we can't continue to use styrofoam in this way. We can't continue to send ice packs to researchers because they don't want this anymore. All because 100 campuses have decided that this is important, and they signaled it by where they put their money. We are changing a $1.5 trillion industry with fewer than 500 people. It's amazing. Oh, thank you. <laughs> well, congratulations to everybody who's a part of this, yes. It's unbelievable. And I've given you examples from our industry, but the truth is if you start to look at other industries, that tipping point tends to be at about the same place, between 3 and 10% across the board. It's an incredibly simple thing to do, to just be conscious of what you're purchasing. And you can have such a tremendous impact. And the best part is you have the opportunity to participate in this every day. So whether it's something as simple as bringing your reusable mug and your own cutlery when you go out, or looking on Amazon for the thing that you want to buy, but then finding a local company that sells it instead. Or maybe just waiting for the cream in your coffee to diffuse for five seconds rather than using the stir. Or maybe when you see only paper cups, thinking to ask for the mug. All of these things, believe it or not, they have a huge impact. So this talk, wasn't about what you should value, right? It is just about thinking, when you're about to make a pur purchase, are you purchasing something with your values in mind? Are you paying attention to what your actions are and ensuring that they align with your intentions? Right? So together, we can have a tremendous, tremendous impact on this planet and on each other by just being conscious of our, of our behavior. All of us here have an intention around sustainable. We're all here, right? So align those intentions with your actions. By consciously changing our behavior, we can make today better than yesterday, to say nothing of tomorrow. Thank you. I'm Cody, I'm with the City of San Diego and I'm our Chief Sustainability Officer. So um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about how climate action actually happens at the local level in government. Um, so a lot of what you've been hearing and what you learn about elsewhere is the concepts, the science, the data, what we need to do um, to kind of fix the problems that we've created or the previous generations have created for us. And then you kind of really don't hear a lot about at the local level how you just roll up your sleeves and get that done. Uh, maybe you've been hearing a little bit that climate action is local action. Has anybody heard that phrase recently? Yeah, a few. It's really hard to see, yeah. Um, I think that's true, and, and you'll see um, how we talk a little bit about what happens at the local level. I'm gonna keep it positive and talk about all the things we're trying to do. Um, there's a lot of things we were just talking about um, during the break of why it's so hard to get things done because there's so many rules and perceptions and issues. Um, and the title, um, I'd like to talk about it because we're trying to embrace the technological solutions as well as all the other actions we need to take. So um, it's not about me. This is about how we're trying to be a smarter city. So I'd like to start also with um, when you start off in, in science and data and you want to just apply that to policy making and make changes. Um, I had a background in science and that's how I moved into policy. And you wonder, like, th this is, seems like a pretty straight line, right? There's facts, there's information. 
you apply that to make decisions, it seems pretty straightforward. This is the actual process. Um, somebody asked me to teach a class on policy making, and that's all I could come up with was, this is how it's done. Um, and I don't even know how to describe that further. So in the city of San Diego, we talked a lot about when we embraced um, climate action and we wanted to do a really ambitious climate action plan, um, we kind of did an inventory of what's working for us. If we really want to get this right, we need to figure out how this could work in our city and not just take kind of a cookie cutter climate action plan and adopt it here. So we thought about all these different things that you see up here. Um, we're the eighth largest city in the country. Did anybody know that? Yeah, a few. Um, that's rare because we don't act like it. <laughs> we're this sleepy city where we're like surfing and, and enjoying the weather and we forget that we're kind of a big deal. Um, we have a ton of engineering degrees here, number five in the country, which is obviously more than our size, um, thanks a lot to UCSD. Um, number four, we, we toggle between these, but these are close enough. Number four in clean tech metro areas. So we have a booming clean tech economy here that's growing. Number two in patent intensity. Also, <laughs> thanks part to UCSD. Um, really just thinking about what these kind of are summarizing is we have a really innovative economy here. We have an innovative workforce. We have talented, younger people coming up in our economy. And as a city, we like to think about what do we want the future to look like for them? Not in like a lovey, touchy, feely way, but in a how do we keep them here and keep them working here and investing in our economy? Um, number one in solar installations. We're actually number two now. I need to update this. But um, we're second to Honolulu. I'm fine being second to them. Um, going on and on. We also have a. a Federal Promise Zone designation. That's a federal um, designation from President Obama. Um, we're only one of 22, and there will be no more under this current administration. And what it does is identify um, communities that are really impacted by low income, low education, high crime, things like that. And we are able to create a really solid nonprofit backbone in that community. So we also have that structure we're building. And finally, we're the largest city to adopt a 100% renewable energy goal. Um, so something you all should be proud of as well since you live here, at least most of you do. Um, so I'll give you a little bit of data just to give you some context. These are our emissions for our city. Your university does their own um, work in this, probably fairly similar, I'm guessing, structure-wise or emission sources-wise. So transportation is a really huge source of emissions. Um, a lot of people, especially when I talk to younger crowds, they like to blame it on the big bad corporations. Um, and I'm actually, no, no, it's you. It's you driving around all the time. <laughs> That's where a lot of our missions come from. The other two big pieces combined are from facilities, um, electricity, natural gas are in buildings, are in lighting, things like that. Obviously, businesses contribute to this, but it's, it's all of us that play a part in these emission sources. And then what a city does when you look at your emission sources is what is the, the technology, what are the tools, what are the levers that we can pull to reduce it. They don't have to line up perfectly with the sources of emissions, um, but, but pretty close. So we project out setting a baseline, um, looking at a business as usual chart, which is the green one going up, what are emissions if we do nothing. And then we, we look at where the state, um, California is pretty aggressive in climate action as well, so we looked at where they think we should be. Um, and then we did a calculation based on all the actions we knew at the time when we adopted our plan of where we think we can get to. These are all modeling projections. And then the, the dots there, the two blue dots, are our actual annual emissions inventory. So we like to now monitor, now that the plan is in place, how are we doing? <laughs> what are, what's this looking like? Do we need to uh, do a lot more? Are we kind of on track? Um, and this is, the, this is kind of the gist of tracking your climate action plan. Um, so you see we're, we're doing pretty good so far. This is all plus or minus a little bit because these are our projections um, and models. But it gives us a sense of where we are. But I like to remind folks that downward trajectory is pretty steep. So we're, we're tackling some of the low-hanging fruit, we like to call it. That's such a government -y term. Um, now it's going to get only harder. So by no means are we resting on our laurels. We have a lot of work to do. So I'll walk you through some of the strategies that we adopted to, to hit these big targets that we have. So the first one is 100% renewable energy. Has anybody heard that we have a goal like that in the city? A little bit? Oh, a lot of you. Wow, how do you all know that? It's awesome. Um, so um, I'll talk a little bit more about that, but this is one of the goals that we're getting the most attention around. It's pretty exciting. It's a nice, shiny, round number. Um, 
and it's really ambitious, and it's um, something that we're working on, exploring a couple different pathways for how to get there. Um, it's a pretty politicized issue, too, so I'll talk a little bit more about it at the end. We also have a target for getting 50% of people to get commute, either by biking, walking, or using transit. So in other words, not driving alone. Um, this is also, <laughs> it, gets a, it gets probably a lot of local attention, but not, not so much so nationally. This, I would say, is equally as big, if not bigger, than the 100% goal, because it's such a, a beast to tackle from a policy perspective. Anybody do anything other than drive to, for their commute? Nice. The next one, this doesn't have nice shiny round goals, but it's really important, if you're, especially if you're shifting to renewable energy. Um, we have uh, targets for energy and water efficiency. So in facilities and buildings, it doesn't make sense to install a whole bunch of renewable if you could be more efficient first. Um, and also from a water perspective, you may have heard that we've had a few droughts. Um, so aside from climate action, it makes sense to save a lot of water. And then this target is zero waste. So we've actually adopted this policy already. We're moving ahead on shifting all of our waste out of the landfill and into composting, recycling, um, reusing all, as many things as we can. And we're seeing a lot of um, businesses crop up around this space too, which is pretty exciting. And then our last goal, anybody guess at this one? Anybody heard me speak and maybe, maybe, <laughs> maybe guessed before? Yeah, thanks, Kyle. <laughs> <laughs> Cheater. <laughs> um, this is a goal for 35% uh, urban tree canopy coverage. Um, how about, can anybody guess what we're at now? Four. Four. 13, we're at 13 now. I'll, sa I'll save you the pain of guessing. Um, yes, so this is a really ambitious goal. It's a very small piece of our actual greenhouse gas emissions reductions, but it's like all the other targets, it's important for a lot of other tangible reasons that people just it's a quality of life issue. If you want to walk down a street on a hot day in San Diego, which we have a lot of those, do you want to walk down a, a concrete street with no trees or with trees? Or do you even cross the street to find the shady side? Um, it's, it saves energy in buildings. It's so many reasons why trees are a great um, uh, target for us aside from greenhouse gas reductions. This target also kind of kicks off the section of our climate action plan about resilience. So all this work we're doing to kind of hit the brakes on reducing our emissions and reducing climate change, we also have to prepare for that impact that's likely already happening. Um, so we're working on a more comprehensive resilience plan as well um, to look at the impacts from wildfire, um, heat, increasing sea levels, increased flooding, things like that in our region. And then all of this we like to report out in a cute little uh, infographic. Um, because again, I want to try to make this tangible to people. Um, we often talk about greenhouse gas emissions. That chart I showed you in the beginning, almost nobody cares about greenhouse gas emissions. There's this statistic that people think about their electricity bill eight minutes a year. I think people think about greenhouse gas emissions much less than that for the most part, except maybe those of us in this room. Um, so we try to put it in terms that, that actually are meaningful to people. Did you see new bike lanes installed? Did you save energy in your home and see your energy bills go down? Um, did you see trees planted? Do you see new cool sensors on your street lights? Things like that. So these are all the metrics that we're trying to report out on. Oh, those are the, those are the impacts. I knew I listed them somewhere. Um, and that's somebody actually paddleboarding down a street in Mission Beach. <laughs> Another area that I try to report on just to make, again, make it more tangible to people and hopefully bring a few more people in, into the fold of being interested in this is looking at our economic impact. And when I started and I talked about what, how the city kind of did this inventory of what's important to us, the economy is really important. Um, and it, it's, um, it's a new way of thinking about sustainability that's not from the traditional save the planet hug a tree type of perspective. It was really thinking about how, how green is green, right? How being good for, the, for uh, business is actually good for the planet. And there's a new way of thinking about business from that perspective. So we're really trying to speak to that audience and embrace that audience as being supporters of what we're trying to do. And having a Republican mayor um, really be a champion for this, that spoke to, to him as well. So we look at um, comparing our GDP to our, our um, emissions and really trying to decouple that argument that says if you force us to reduce emissions, you're going to kill the economy. And well, that's just not happening here. We're seeing our GDP going up quite a bit and our emissions going down. 
We also look at jobs in the, the kind of general categories of the Climate Action Plan. And between 2010, which is our baseline, and 2016, you've seen it increase. It's 10.9% increase in these uh, job growth in these sectors. That's higher than the overall economy um, in our region. Another component of our Climate Action Plan that I'm, I'm particularly proud of, although we are still struggling to, to understand how to, how to do it well, is the social equity component. So we look at if we're going to make improvements to our city, which is what we think we're doing with the Climate Action Plan, how do we make sure that everybody benefits from those and not just certain segments of our society? And how can we actually even lift up some of the more disadvantaged communities through this process? And so we just started by trying to report on some metrics and investments we're making in our low and moderate income communities, and we really are trying to tackle this a lot better and, and, um, and dig into this a lot further. And talking about um, getting attention and being in the media, so these are just some of the, the headlines that we've seen. Uh, there was one recently, I should update this, in the New York Times about our energy initiatives um, that came out last week, actually. Um, and then I like to point out all the, the national attention we're getting is generally positive and excited and, wow, who, San Diego, who are you? What are you doing? What, what, are, you, what, are, you, what are you going big on? And then the last one is my favorite because it's the local media and they like to, to have, say things slightly different. And I thought their headline was pretty funny. Who do you hate less, your government or your utility company? Thank you, Voice of San Diego. <laughs> Um, and then this is getting a little bit older now, but um, I mentioned having a Republican mayor. And when, our, when um, President Trump was withdrawing from the Paris Climate Agreement, you know, we kind of wrestled with, what do we say to that? You know, we, our mayor is part of the Republican Party. How does he kind of uh, deal with those, that kind of dichotomy there? And we, talk, we thought a lot about it. And eventually, he decided to take this position, which was that we're, we, as a city, are committed to the Paris Climate Accord. And not only are we committed to it, our, our climate action plan is more ambitious and uh, legally binding. So we're in. We're all in. And this was so, uh, one, of the, one of the moments in local government when I was felt pretty proud of what we were doing. And then I just wanted to close with um, this is one of the, this is the 100% renewable energy initiative that we're working on. You are going to hear a little bit more about this because it's a big policy initiative that we're moving through right now. Um, and you'll see it in local media. If anybody doesn't read The Voice of San Diego, despite their funny headlines, I recommend reading The Morning Report. I was at a SDSU presentation. I think no student read that. Um, so if you don't read it, I recommend it. Um, so th currently, we buy energy um, from our utility company, right? You, you don't have a choice. And if you don't pay your energy bill, you'll understand this soon. Um, but our utility company purchases energy on your behalf. They deliver it to you, and that's what you use. You may have solar panels on your roof. Anybody have solar? You still are connected to the grid. You still pay an sdg e bill. Um, there's another option that we're also exploring. So we're working with both the utility company, which is sdg &E. There's another option that's allowable in the, in the state of California. It's called CCA. It's Community Choice Aggregation. It's a really wonky political term, uh, a government term. And what it means is that a local government can take over the buying, the purchasing of energy, and determine what types of power they want to see. So in theory, if we formed a CCA in San Diego, we could decide what kind of power do we want, how much renewable we want, and then deliver that in partnership with the utility, and it, and it ends up in customers. So we're exploring both of these options now and looking at costs and um, potential renewable sources and all sorts of things um, with these two options and um, hoping to make a decision on this by the end of the year and bring it forward to our city council. So it's a pretty big move for us, and I'm sure you could talk more about um, energy activity on campus. If you haven't heard from Dave already, <laughs> you will ask him all sorts of hard questions. Um, but um, you all are exploring some similar um, increases in renewable for your campus, and it's, it's pretty exciting. A lot of the folks that spoke already, I want to thank every, all the other speakers, too, and everybody else that's here tonight. Um, I think this is a really great venue for this discussion around sustainability. And one of the things that I tried to do with my talk was to zoom out a little bit and um, look at some uh, principles that were developed in the early 90s by William McDonough. So William McDonough is a green architect as well. But he's also gone on to start a company um, with Michael Brunart where they design products that go into buildings. And so I'm going to talk about that a little bit. But the main um, discussion of my presentation is the Hanover Principles by William McDonough. And he started in um, 
the early 90s developing these principles, but they were being developed for the, 19, uh, the 2000 uh, World's Fair Expo in Hanover, Germany. And so um, each one of the slides has a different principle on it, and there's 10 slides, um, nine principles that I'm gonna go over, and they all really relate back to a little bit of what everybody has talked about so far tonight. And then I'm gonna end my talk with just referencing the North Torrey Pines Living Learning Neighborhood Project, which I'm the program manager for, um, and that is a LEED Platinum project. So in the beginning, you heard the CNI ambassadors talk about how we're achieving some of our carbon neutrality goals, and some of that is through green building, right? And so the North Torrey Pines Living Learning Neighborhood has a whole bunch of green building aspects to it, um, but I'm really only gonna just kind of touch on that. So the first uh, principle, um, going backwards, is insist on the rights of humanity and nature to coexist in healthy, supportive, diverse, and sustainable conditions. And those are just some images up there of Central Park and, and an image of a river walk along a city in China, right? But I think we all experience this all the time is our interaction with nature and how, whether it's in a city or even if you're out in the country, you know, what is the human impact on nature? And so the first principle of the Hanover Principles is that ability to coexist, right? And kind of thinking about how that can be healthy, supportive, and, you know, really work for everyone, including all the species that are in the world too, the other animals that, um, you know, surround our cities and, and are out in protected areas that we deal with. So coexist is the main takeaway from that first principle. And then the second principle is recognizing interdependence. So we've all heard of the Declaration of Independence here in the United States. That's a pretty common term, but I'm not sure. Has anybody ever heard of the Declaration of Interdependence? One person used to do, host a show in Canada called The Nature of Things. And so David Suzuki Foundation was founded in the early 90s as well, kind of around the same time that the Hanover Principles were happening. And so in 1999, they created something called the Declaration of Interdependence. And that's this up here. I'm not going to read it all. Um, you know, you can't really see it. It's kind of tiny. But basically, it talks about acknowledging how we're impacting the Earth. And then it really establishes a kind of new hope around what we can do to change that. And then at the end of the Declaration of Interdependence, it commits to that kind of change, right? And so that's a lot of what everybody here has been talking about previously, too, is different aspects of s sustainability and how does it make a difference. And this interdependence also takes into account the previous slide about coexisting because the interdependence is that one doesn't really exist without the other, right? So there's, there's a, a quote up there from Alan Watts that talks about the birds and the flowers and that without one, you don't have the other. And it's kind of without our human interaction with nature and then all the things we do to inhabit the built environment that we've created, you know, they're, they're all interrelated, right? So the other thing about this too is that one effect, a small effect in one place it's kind of like you probably heard the term the butterfly effect, but one little thing that happens in one place can have a huge impact somewhere else, right? So a lot of the things that we do um, have that relationship. They're all tied into this kind of web of interdependence. So respect relationships between spirit and matter. This one's a little bit hard to get your head around, I guess, but maybe it's simple. Um, but for me, just to, to talk about it and present it, um, you know, the relationship between spirit and matter is kind of the human condition and all of the processes and politics and situations that we've created and then the results of that, right? So policy and things that define how we develop in different places. So there's a couple examples up here that I'm just going to point out real quick. Um, there's a book by... Um, Jared Diamond called, um, I don't know if this is gonna work, yeah, you probably can't see it, but it's Guns, Germs, and Steel. And it really talks about how those things influence um, 
development and how things that we wouldn't necessarily plan for have a huge impact on society, right? And, and so um, just a, an example is, is probably, um, you know, the development or, or germs as an example where people came from one place to another and it decimated, you know, large groups of people, right? So, so there's kind of unintended consequences of what we do as human beings that affect society as a whole and it affects where we live and then our patterns of development and those sorts of things. The other one in the middle um, is referencing the, the Garden City movement. So Ebenezer Howard and Clarence Stein and a bunch of folks back in the 1920s um, started talking about how to develop sustainably and it was called the Garden City movement. So you might have heard of garden apartments, um, you know, and just in general, I, I lived in a place called Radburn, New Jersey which was designed by Clarence Stein and it had a train station and the, the cars were separated from the pedestrian pathways and every, every house had its own connection to the garden and then the parks led to the school for the students, right? So there was some real intentionality behind the garden movement around sustainability and that was before they were calling it that. Um, and then the last example over on the right-hand side um, is eco-districts. And I don't know if any of you have heard of eco-districts. Cody probably has. Um, but the city of San Diego, probably in 2014, a uh, couple people from the city and then myself and two or three other folks that are involved with Beautiful PB went up to um, Portland to work with a group of folks on eco-districts. And so it's... It's a way of infusing sustainability into a community at large. So that does still exist in beautiful PB in some form that where they're pursuing eco districts. I don't know. I know that it was proposed for in some of the planning policy for the city of San Diego, and I don't know that it's been adopted yet. But the idea there is, and, and this is an organization up in Portland that does workshops all around the country throughout the year to define what's possible in a broader environment of an entire community. So, um, and then the top one is just referring to um, the story of stuff. So has anybody heard of the story of stuff? One, two, three, four, five, a few people. Yeah, so Annie Leonard made these videos years ago um, and, and she's still making more. Um, but the story of stuff just describes how products are made and really what the impact is on the environment in a cartoon fashion. And it's really, it's, it's a great way to understand the bigger picture, you know, it has different metrics and all those things. Um, Cody referenced some of that stuff and I think Jacques is gonna maybe talk about it a little bit too later, is like, how do we produce things and how do those get into the world that we live in? So the next principle is accept responsibility for the consequences of design. And the examples that I have up here have to do with two things, nature and human beings, right? So when we design things, um, there was a good example um, that Allison shared before about the freezer and like nobody's really thinking about it. Is it very energy efficient or not? Um, and so what Bill McDonough was saying here was ex accepting responsibility for the consequence of design would be, you know, how do we make it more energy efficient? How do we make it work better to serve the purpose that it serves with the least amount of impact on the environment. And then there's another whole set of terms that, that have come up about regenerative design, right? So that you're not actually making things less bad, but you're making things function more like nature does, right? So um, the reference up here is Paul Hawken, and the book is, is called Natural Capitalism. And in that book, um, he wrote that right around uh, 1999, I think. Natural Capitalism came out in the Harvard Business Review, did a, a survey of a bunch of different sustainability type business um, kind of uh, references and natural capitalism was one of them. And basically in that book, he's saying, Paul Hawken and Amory Lovins were saying that the environment in our capitalist society isn't valued for what it actually is. It's more uh, when you harvest products out of the environment, whether it's mining or cutting down trees or and things like that, um, that there is no actual valuation of that. The, the whoever 
is doing that and producing products doesn't factor in the replacement value of our natural resources necessarily. So natural capitalism recognizes that and tries to factor that in. And some of the things that they've suggested is that if we accounted for the natural capitalism, the natural capital itself, um, that the degradation of the environment would, would not be as extreme as it has been over the years, right? And that kind of thinking happened almost 20 years ago, and there are a lot of companies that think this way, that believe in the tenets in that book, um, and are doing things about it, right? But it's, these principles were from 25 years ago, right? So a lot of things have changed since then, but it seems like in some cases more slowly than, than what it really could be or, or, or should be, right? And then the other aspect of this is the human factor, right, is we design the built environment for people. It's not, you know, a lot of like the lead rating system looks at the building and how efficient the building is and the products and the things that are used in the building, but there's something now called the well rating system and um, we, are, we are looking at that um, here on campus to see where it might fit into some of our projects to get a well, um, well building rated facility here at UCSD. Um, but the idea is that air, water, nourishment, light, fitness, comfort, and mind for, for the human beings that inhabit the built environment are the things that we're measuring, right? And then we're improving people's health or at least we're figuring out what are the things that affect people's health. A couple examples are like fresh air or natural light. Um, it could be the, the products and how they off gas into, into the air and things like that. So all those things get factored into it. And so fundamentally accepting responsibility for the consequences of design can protect nature and humans, right? Which is what we're doing all this for. I have too many devices here. Um, so create safe objects of long-term value. Um, the example all the way on the right is just, um, you probably can't read it, but it's basically a, a roadmap of what to do with nuclear waste. And my position on that, me personally, is don't create nuclear waste and then you don't have to figure out what to do with it, like shoot it into space or bury it, you know, 5,000 miles under the earth or whatever, you know, whatever the, those schemes are. And, and basically, if you read the rest of this about creating safe objects of long-term value, it says don't burden future generations with requirements of maintenance or vigilant administration of potential danger due to the careless creation of products, processes, and standards. So that's the full version of, of that principle. And really what is happening is um, we have uh, organizations like the Living Building Challenge that have something called Declare where all the products that are in the built environment actually disclose what is in the products. And there, there was always something called MSDS sheets, which is a, a technical term, but it's a material safety data sheet. But this takes it another level and actually a lot of companies um, you know, were concerned about um, disclosing too much of their special information, but this is really making progress and, and working out pretty well. So the health product declaration too is another part of the um, create safe objects of long-term value, and it's another way of, of measuring what is in the product and then how that affects the people in the buildings. So eliminate the concept of waste is pretty straightforward. I won't go into it in a whole lot of detail. I have to try to wrap it up too, because I'm getting close to my 15. Um, but zero waste economy, um, you know, Cody talked about it a little bit. I think some other folks were talking about how do we manage waste? How do we get to zero waste? And it's complicated because it's not just about what you produce but it's about how you manage it too. So the cups in the back of the room, somebody's gotta go wash them and somebody's gotta bring them out. So there's all that stuff involved. And then Cradle to Cradle just talks about biological nutrients and technical nutrients. So there's a distinction between things that you can recycle that are biological that you can use over and over again. And then there's things that are technical that maybe use rare earth materials and things like that that aren't easily replicable, and, and so those things still need to be incorporated into the built environment, but just finding smart ways to do that is important. 
relying on natural energy flows, and that's really just solar power, geothermal, um, wind, hydropower, right? All of those things that we can use that are part of nature and part of the natural environment are really the best sources of energy for us to use because they're perpetual and they just continue without or just harnessing that energy is really the technical aspect of that. And really in buildings, we're, we, we've advanced quite a bit in the last 25 years to incorporate all those kinds of things to make buildings really efficient. And then understanding the limitations of design. So those um, images up there are from the Expo 2000 from Hanover, Germany. So these principles were based on that. And an architect uh, named Shugaru Ban designed these structures that are made with cardboard tubes. So it's kind of like an Eiffel Tower with cardboard tubes, sort of. But both of those structures that are shown up there, and the one um, in, in the upper left-hand corner is, is a huge amphitheater area that's all built with, with cardboard tubes that are um, recyclable. And so um, there's a quote up in the right hand. You probably can't see it. It's by Albert Einstein. But he's basically saying, you know, look to nature and you will understand everything better, right? And then there's a reference to biomimicry in, architect in architecture. And I think, you know, one of the things here is that understanding the limitations of design, it says treat nature as a model and mentor, not as an inconvenience to be evaded or controlled, right? So, I th and then Jacques is gonna talk about biomimicry, which is pretty awesome segue, because it's a super interesting topic. Um, the last thing I wanna just mention, and I'm gonna get, get the hook off the stage here, is that we are, we're doing a green building education program here at UCSD. It's in a pilot volunteer phase right now. Um, but the idea is to use the North Torrey Pines Living Learning Neighborhood Project as a um, basically backdrop and then other future capital projects to allow students here on campus to learn about green building. So, um, you know, if anybody's interested in that, it's, it's definitely more technically oriented around the lead rating system, but there are other things like well and living building challenge that we'll be touching on and talking about. And uh, we're excited about it because we think it'll create pathways for students um, in their careers that will more closely align to sustainability in, in the built environment fundamentally. So we're pretty excited about that. And the last one um, is the Living Learning Neighborhood, North Torrey Pines. Don't have time to get into all of it, but I'm happy to share um, with anybody who's interested after the talk. So good evening. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm um, thrilled to be able to share my passion for, for the natural world. So I'm going to walk you through kind of my journey in biomimicry. And um, what we're going to be talking about is the relationship with the natural world and how we can learn from it. So I was, I was actually born and raised in Switzerland. And I spent most of my life, uh, most of my time uh, growing up with my family outdoor. Um, and enjoying nature. And as a young child, I was always mesmerized by the beauty in nature, especially the, how elegant and beautiful it was and how much we could learn from it. What my parents taught me growing up is the importance of caring for the environment because these ecological services are there for us, but they're there for future generations as well. In my early career, um, I worked in management consulting. Um, even though the work was very exciting, uh, what turned out is um, often I realized I wasn't really helping the right people. I often felt that um, I was working with companies that, in my mind, were greatly impacting the earth. So from that point on, I decided to shift and decide to focus entirely my time on protecting and nurturing the earth. And that led me on this journey of reconnecting with the earth. And I spend a lot of time outdoor. I spend many times possible away from cities. And the goal here was for me to reconnect with the natural world. And in doing so, I realized how much I was um, enjoying being outdoor, but also how much I appreciated the natural world and have a lot more humility and respect for all living things. 
And as a matter of fact, there's a lot of science that says the most time we spend outside, the more we feel restored, the more we feel alive, less stressful, less depressed, but also more creative. So humans have a deep connection with the natural world. And if you look back into our ancestors, how they lived not that long ago, their living room was outdoor. They spent their entire time outside. They had a deep connection with the natural world, and they knew how to, they understood the limits, the boundaries, but they also knew how to respect it. Today, unfortunately, we spend most of our time indoor, and often we don't really have a chance to go outdoor and really enjoy nature for what it is. And often I also see that people are becoming even sometimes afraid of nature. It's like if nature was something else separate from humans. But the truth is, humans are nature, and we are part of it. We happen to be the dominant species on this planet who is doing great things, but also greatly impactful. But we have to learn how to share the world with all the other species and what we can learn from them. The impacts on the Earth is significant. Humans have conquered every single place on the planet. And we're going to continue having an impact, and even though we're changing survival, but ultimately the survival of the planet itself. And we realize so heavily on these ecological services to, to live that we don't realize the value of what these services provide to us. So one of the reasons why we're, we're here where we're here, we, where we are today, it has to do with the economic system that we live in. And this is nothing wrong with it. It's been the system that we use for the longest time, and it's been very good for us. But the system is very much relying on a linear focus from extraction all the way to or disposable. And the problem we're having in that process is so far us as consumers, as many other speakers mentioned, we're so disconnected from it. Because we're solely focused on one area, which is consumption. I mean, the US GDP is roughly 70% consumption, 30% industrial output. But that process has also another hidden um, element, is the energy intensive process that it takes to do anything that we buy today. So even though it sounds alarming, but there's also great hope that we could rethink and re-understand how we can evolve from there. Another way to look at this perspective is if you look at the Earth history, so the Earth has been around for 4 billion years or so, if you bring it all together into one calendar year, this is what it would look like, and this is for the sake of illustration. January 1st, the Earth is formed. January 25th, life appears. 29, life realized that photons, free energy, is a much easier resource to rely on, and that's what they choose. Then Fast forward to August, we have multicellular life, and then we have November, you have fungi, fish, insects, and then we have all the others that we're very well known today, reptile, mammal, birds, and flowers. What I'm asking you is, where are the humans on that chart? Well, the whole human history would have taken place the last half hour of the last day. And industrial revolution, which is the advance of a modern society, would have taken place the last two seconds. So this illustration, it's really to show that we humans, even though we're very dominant, we're a very, very young species. And we have so much to learn from elders. So much to learn from plants and trees, so much to learn from fungi, from insects, and from systems like wetlands that have been around longer than humans and have learned how to thrive and survive in this evolving planet. When we look at nature, it's always interesting to look at how nature makes stuff. That's something that I'm always passionate about. How does nature create strong materials? In this example, the abalone shell is a unique material made of calcium carbonate with a combination of a protein that is layered in a such a way, in a such a pattern, that creates a very tough material that is tougher to any other materials that we make today. So that's how nature makes stuff. Polar bear, fascinating creatures, they live in a very unique environment. How do they keep themselves warm? It's a combination of their diet, the type of furs that they have. But scientists actually even realized recently by studying them that the bears, compared to the other bears that we have out there, the brown bear and the, and the black bear, that they, their one particular gene has evolved. And there is a gene that creates a particular molecule called nitric oxide that basically tells the body, the cells, instead of converting the nutrients into metabolic energy, 
it turns into energy to be turned into heat so that the bear can maintain body temperature. We've talked about desalination. Some mentioned mangrove, how important it is. They're basically nature's way of desalinating. How can we learn from it using low energy process that is still very efficient? Calcium carbonate is pretty much the foundations of coral reef, but they're managing the usage of CO2 and converting into structures. Can we learn from that? As a matter of fact, the company did that, looked at CO2 generation from, from power plant, and see if we can convert that into carbon rocks. And it's a company in California that was able to create carbon rocks by using the biomineralization process in nature and creating carbon rocks that could be mixed into concrete. So nature has this huge potential for us of 3.8 billion years of continuous R&D evolutions. They're well-adapted designs with successful survival strategies. So when you practice biomimicry, we use it as a tool, and this tool is not going to solve everything, but it's a tool that you can have in your toolbox. You can do it in three ways. Looking at form, how form could fit a particular function. Process, really how nature makes stuff, and manufacturing things using low process, low energy, and so on. And system, how nature as a whole is able to communicate, share, and collaborate at a larger scale. So this is a Galapagos shark, a unique creature that um, has a unique adaptation, is that uh, it has this barrier on its skin that prevents microbes and bacteria to grow. Scientists were really stunned by this. And this is what it looks like at the nanoscale. It has a very unique structure. So a company went ahead and mimicked that structure at the nanoscales and say, well, we have that problem in our own world. When we have surfaces that we have to keep clean and we have to use harsh chemicals or worse, we have to dispose it, we have a way that perhaps could solve this. And they actually create a product that mimics the, the shark skin that inhibits bacterial growth and therefore could potentially help reduce the impact that we have on the earth. The next example is process. And this is one of my favorite organisms. It's the tardigrade. You find it everywhere on earth. It's the most uh, durable organism that I know of. Uh, and one characteristic that this particular organism has is the ability to remain dormant in absence of water. So when water disappears wherever it lives, what this creature does is it remove all the water from its body, has a protein that protects all its organs, it can remain dormant for perhaps a decade or longer. So companies were like, well, this is interesting. And I know the speaker mentioned about the biotech industry, how we're relying on freezers to keep molecules at very low temperature for research and other needs or forensic labs and so on. This company mimicked the process, replicated the chemical process that we have in the target grid, and came up with a solution that allows you to store DNA and RNA in other molecules at room temperature. The last example is on system, which is, in this case, a wetland, which we used to have a lot in San Diego. We have probably less than 1% today. But they're a useful element in protecting two bodies of water. They're actually nature's way of filtering water. And they're basically a combination of plants, rocks, organisms, bacteria that all work together in slowing the water path and then reducing uh, or capturing the pollutants before it reached the ocean or other body of water. So a company looked at it and says, can we reconstruct a wetland so that we can use it in our own wastewater treatment plant? A wastewater treatment plant is very energy intensive. But here is an example where they were in China. This is what it looked like. This is what the outfall out of a community, raw sewage coming in out, which has all kinds of public health and other environmental issues. And then what this company did is they built basically a constructed wetland that was a combination of rocks and, and sediments and plants and other microbes, and now it's a functioning waste, wastewater treatment plant. And this company called Janta Ecological Design, when I talked to John, he, he, he told me that any pollutants could potentially be cleaned by, by, by a combination of plants and rocks if we do it in the right, the right way. So when we look at nature, we often realize that man-made design is a very much linear design versus cyclical design in nature. 
In human environment, we tend to maximize. We want the largest, the biggest, nature's optimized. We use processes that are very energy intensive, where nature relies on self-assembly. And we were very much disposable these days, where nature is all biodegradable, which is the full cycle of recycling everything uh, to be reused over time. I want to walk you to one more example. And this is a company that I'm a big fan. Because when we're going to change the world, it's going to start here at UCSD with great research, but it's also going to start with great companies. And Interface is a company that was created in the late 70s by Ray Anderson. And Ray, in the mid-90s, he was the CEO of the company, realized that he wanted to change course. He wanted to make his company more greener. And if you've ever been in a carpet manufacturing, it's a very energy-intensive process. There's a lot of waste. There's a lot of disposal at the end of the life of the product and so on. So Ray and his team in the, in the, in the late 1990s designed the carpet tile, which was really mimicking the, the, the forest floor. But he didn't stop there. He kept on going and looked at other solutions to improve it. And one of the challenges he had when you install carpet is you use glue. And glue is obviously very toxic to the user, to the people living in the area, but it's also challenging in how you dispose it. And, in, and by looking into nature and how nature adheres to surfaces, he came up with a tactile solution. And that tactile solution doesn't need, doesn't need any glue. It basically holds itself using gravity and by having every single tile interlocking to each other. The process is very easy to install. It's also easy to remove. Uh, it was well, very welcomed by the installer and saw a lot of value. This particular line of product for interface is over a billion, uh, half a billion dollar market. They didn't stop there. They actually went on and continued looking at how they make carpet. If you ask Ray, Ray passed away five years ago. Um, he wanted to make sure that by 2020, that's still a goal, that all their carpets will, be have, will have what's called zero emission, meaning that every carpet they will manufacture after 2020 will be made from recycled materials, no longer raw materials, that require the company to redesign the product so that product could be deassembled when they bring back the product from the customer back to the factory so they could remake carpet over time. And that really involved rethinking in that process. They also went a step further and realized that there's a lot of fishing gears in the ocean that are abundant. It's actually in the upward of 640,000 tons of fishing gears that is just laying out at the bottom of the ocean on the reef. So he engaged a bunch of fishermen. The company engaged a bunch of fishermen in the Philippines who lost the ability to, to access their fishing grounds because the, the fisheries has collapsed and engaged them to go out there and fish fishing gears that could be uh, transformed into nylon to be making carpet again. The company is continuing kind of being the front leader in saying that sustainability is very possible and the impossible, impossible could be done if, if you only put yourself forward. The next step the company is going forward right now is a carpet factory um, that would function like a forest. Ray had a vision. He said that his factory should not have any impact on, the, any, uh, any impact on ecological services. His vision was that ultimately his factory could potentially help restore the environment. And that's where they're embarking right now. It's looking at this deeper sustainability using at ecological performance standards. So imagine a factory where you are able to, a factory that could produce uh, air, that could, that could clean air and water as much as the local ecosystem. And the same thing if the factory is able to sequest CO2 as much as the local ecosystem. So the factory becomes also a place where they're, um, they're helping regenerating uh, the local environment. The process that eco um, Interface went through is moving away from this idea that we extract resources and then we dispose it, moving from recycling, which is essential, it's a great step, to eventually getting into the circular economy where you are reusing the materials over time and diverting, uh, have no diversion of waste to the landfill. And that's really where we're heading today. And that's, that's sort of the reality of how business are going to move forward and continue, continue to remain competitive. So we all know today the economy is growing in the US. It's been growing for, for the last several years. 
The, US, the, the world economy is growing as well. The question I have for you is, what kind of economy do we want? Do we want the old system, which was worked very well for us, or do we want to move on to a, a new system? In the new system, we'll look at restorative economy, regenerative economy, but especially looking at sustainability not as a limiting factor, but as a driver for change. And businesses are going to be the ones doing that for us moving forward. So I'll leave you with this. If tomorrow or today you're faced with a design challenge, I would advise you to seek advice from nature. Thank you. We'll be taking questions for 15 minutes, and please step up to the mic. Don't be shy. Again, we have Kyle Heiskala, Cody Hooven, Belinda Ramirez, Walt Kanzler, Allison Paradise, and Jack Shirazi. Take it away. Hello. Hello. Uh Cody, I loved how you mentioned uh, transportation was a big part of our. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Of our um, of our footprint, and I was wondering because uh, UCSD has been having a lot of um, great in initiatives for the carbon neutrality, but the transportation is is you know their goal is 2050, and that's over 30 years away, and most of the people working here won't even be here then. And anybody I've talked to about having alternative modes of transportation, um, they just say they don't have funding for it. So is there any kind of um, advice you could, you could give? Because, uh, well, and I'm, and I'm staff, and a lot of the staff, they showed a, a chart earlier, but the staff you use even more, um, or commute by car more. So I just would really like there to be more incentives for public transportation and uh, bike. And so if you can either relate what the city is doing and or what UCSD could do to, to help push that more. Sure, um, I can start and if anybody else has wants to chime in, I know you have some experience with this too, um, or maybe I'll just put Dave on the spot. Um, one of the things, I mean, just kind of brainstorming off the top of my head is to get involved. So uh, our regional transportation agency is going through and updating their uh, transportation plan. Go and tell them what you want. If that's what you want, they need to hear from folks like you and not just folks that say something different than you. Because for everybody that wants transportation that's accessible, it's mass transit or biking or walking, I guarantee you there is 10 people that say, I want to drive my car and leave me alone. Um, so get involved in any way that you can that's comfortable for you. Um, for your campus, you, you know, these, the, the targets that we have that are 2050 sounds crazy far away. 2035 used to sound far away to me and now I feel like it's around the corner. Um, you know, there's some infrastructure changes that are really expensive and take a long time to, to build up funding for. Um, it's like, I can't speak to specifically their goals, but um, be vocal about what you want and push for it. Um, I think we'll have another uh, vote coming up soon for more um, increasing our taxes to fund more transportation. It unfortunately costs a lot of money to do that. Um, and in the meantime, try a different form of transportation. At the city, we're working on the longer term infrastructure changes that are expensive and take a while. We also are now working on a, just a behavior change campaign, which is really just trying to make it cooler to try taking the bus or the trolley or biking or walking because we really feel that a lot of times it's just somebody hasn't thought that that's accessible to them. So we're working on kind of it from that angle as well. I'm going to stop there. If anybody else has anything else to add, please jump in. Um, I can speak to a, a time when staff and faculty had a free transportation program that was then uh, cut because of an unsustainable funding model. Uh, and. As students, when we were crafting a transportation program for, for the undergraduates and graduates, uh, I noticed that staff and faculty, they were being left out of, of the conversations. Uh, they weren't necessarily uh, involved, and I always wondered what if they could be bundled in together with the students. Um, and that would require a policy change on the local level, like uh, the Metropolitan Transit System. They have uh, an ordinance that allows for student fares in the region. 
but there isn't a, a necessarily the same equivalent for staff and faculty at universities. Uh, but if you worked together with the student body to potentially create a, a group of people that could ask for that policy change on the local level, then you could start qualifying students and faculty for the same discounted prices. Because I know that that uh, in 2012, there were probably about 1,200 staff and faculty that were regularly using the program, and now it's dropped off to maybe a couple hundred. So start there. Too.